Hello, so we're going to play a little bit with Git um, and Git Bash, and we're going to create um, a website from a template. So I'm in my file explorer, and I'm in where my files are. Um, so yours may be similar or a little bit different. And I'm going to open up the, class, the folder that I have for HTML, CSS one. Let's see. And actually, I'm just going to go ahead and go back a little bit. And I'm going to right click right there and hit um, get bash here. OK, so I want to do a PWD. And it's going to give me my present working directory, which should match what's up here. And you can see how it's pretty much mimicking, you know, the directory of our desktop, academic year 1920 HTML CSS1, which is um, what it is for mine. And PWD as reminders, present working directory. And it should give you um, a similar um, location for your particular file. Um, so I'm trying to remember some of the commands. We're going to make a folder. So I believe that's M A K D I R. We'll see if I'm right. Okay, so I think I need to maybe do a name. M K D I R. Um, what do I want to name this? Let's just name this um uh web page templates, something like that. Did that work? Did directory dir to see if there is okay, so there is a folder called web page templates. Um, so make directory M MKDIR, um, the abbreviation for make directory in my mind anyways, whether it's officially, I don't know. Um, well, and then you put the name of the folder that you're wanting and then the DIR, um, to give a list of everything that's in that particular folder. So if I actually click on here, you'll, I, you'll see how I have now a folder name web page templates where I didn't have before. Um, so let's go ahead and CD change directory to web page templates. And if I go DIR, there should only be, looks like there's nothing really in there, which is fine. Okay, yeah, there's nothing in there. Um, okay. So now we created a folder using Git Bash, and I'm going to go ahead and open up into VS Code. So you do code space period, and it should open up in VS Code. So this opened up directly into VS Code. Um, it's in a folder with the web page templates. There's nothing in it because there is nothing in it. And um, that's where I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to go ahead and continue. I was going to stop this video, but I'm just going to make it a continuous one. So some of you guys had asked, you know, about the ability just to create a website on, you know, on a whim. Like if I told you your your worries, like if somebody's going to ask you, you need to create this web page or website and you're not going to know what to do, where to start. Well, I wanted to kind of ease those concerns. Is that something that's going to happen with practice? Like I said in the beginning of the class, there is um, no magic wand. There's no fairy dust. It's repetition, repetition, repetition. You know, spelling words 10 times each, repetition. Um, so, but having said that, I, the expectation for anybody to create a website from scratch, you know, especially if you're going to be working in an organization, is pretty minimal um, just because of the time that it takes. So what we're going to do is um, you can see where I'm going to W3 schools. In the search, I'm going to look for an RWD for responsive web design 
I think that's what are you? Yeah. Responsive web something design, I'm assuming. So there are templates out there. W3 Schools has one. That's what we're getting ready to pull up. And responsive web design, yes. Um, now, you may have heard of Bootstrap. Um, you know, it's another template um, resource. We're not going to use this because I'm personally not a fan of it. I think it's um, too too confusing, but and it's too convoluted, and it just gets it, it gets really crazy and really hard to decipher. There's a bunch of nesting going on. Some people like it. This is actually created by Twitter, um, like by the founders of Twitter. Um, so there's a relationship between Twitter and here. It's a good tool. Um, if you have the time to kind of go through and see what it's about. Um, but here are what it is. Basically, it gives you some website templates and then you would customize them for, you know, whatever your needs are. It's great. Um, but sometimes, like I said, there's some little nuances that can be really confusing and really frustrating. So that's why we're not using that. So, but W3 Schools, um, they have responsive web design templates that I like, and they're a little bit simpler to use, especially when you're getting, you know, acclimated to it, um, that they don't have all that confusing nesting and stuff. So you can see that there's a variety of different templates that you can use. And the one that I like, that I'm working on for another project is this one right here. So what I want you to do is to go through and find one that you like. Um, and we're going to go ahead and click demo on this one. And so this is the demo for the web page. Website rather, because it's got multiple pages. Okay, so you can see there's links. And there's, you know, some placeholder content in there. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead back. No. Let me just close that tab out. Okay, here it is. Then we're going to click try it yourself. And what I'm going to do, what we're going to do is we're just going to control A to copy all of that. Or we can, you know, yeah, okay, just do control A to copy all of that. Copy, and we're going to go in VS Code and oh, it looks like something was downloading. I should probably do that, but I'm not right now. So we're in the web page templates. Go to File. New file. Control V to paste it. And we're going to save it. Save as. So I'm in my web page templates folder. Um, we're just going to save it index.html. Okay. Now there is an extension on here. That's not what I want. Extensions. Where's my extensions? There we go. That will allow you to preview your web page without having to um, go through the process that we've been doing. Which one was it? I think it was browser preview. I have it installed, so. Yeah, this looks like it. So what I encourage you to go ahead is in, uh, install the extensions. So you click on the left hand side, these little blocks. And I just did a search for preview. And then there's um, click on browser preview. I've already got mine installed, but yours would say um, it would need to be installed. So go ahead and install that. Um, 
I think this one you call it by control V. Getting started, click on the sidebar. Let's see, I'm trying to figure out. Maybe this isn't the one that I'm using. Looks like I have it installed, but I don't think it's the one that I'm using. Maybe it's this one. I think it was this one. Okay, this is the one I'm using. Looks like I have both, but this is the one that I'm trying to tell you about right now. So preview on web server. So to launch on the browser, you can do a control shift L or um, to do a side panel, control shift V. And what that'll do is, let's see, you can, it'll be able to see it on the side panel, which is nice sometimes. And then, or you, it'll show up actual browser. But sometimes you don't need to necessarily keep switching back and forth to the browser and just seeing it on the side panel suffices um, through periodic checks. Okay, so you're, you would need to install that. I want to go ahead and close this out. And go ahead and close this. Close that. Okay. Control Shift V. Now, sometimes there is a bit of a delay for it to show on the side panel. And what I end up is this is still installing. What I usually end up doing is getting impatient and hit it a few different times and then have multiple tabs that open up. So just be aware of that. And um, you can see this is what it looks like. Okay. So let's talk about a few things. Um, I'm gonna make notes. Uh -huh. So this is what the web page looks like, um, just as a full browser page. But you'll notice that whenever we're doing the preview page right here, it's a little bit different. Like it's it's um, the content's a little bit more squished. Um, and this is not. Don't worry about the images. We'll talk about that later. But just like the layout's a little bit different. Like this is right on top of each other, or as opposed to this one right here. They're side by side. And let's even open it up in the developer tools. So control shift I. So bigger than what I want. If you look in the top left hand side, it says toggle device toolbar. Um, you can click on that and it kind of gives you the different looks as it would be for different size devices. Okay, so what is responsive web design? So the reason it does that is because of responsive web design. So responsive web design makes your page look page um, web page look good on all devices. Um, it can use uses only HTML or CSS. It is not a program or a JavaScript. So, so you have a desktop version, and then you have a tablet version, and then you have a phone version. So let's click on that. And let's see. So you'll, you'll be familiar with this because it's usually the content that um, comes up whenever you do that initial emit for the head content to appear when you open up and create a new web page. Um, these are some CSS. Okay, right here. So this right here is what kind of helps make responsive web design responsive. 
um, whenever a um, screen is, has a minimum width of 600 pixels, these are the characteristics that it's going to apply. When it's a little bit bigger, these are the characteristics it's going to apply. And it looks like this may look, use a little bit of bootstrap. I can't really see where it is in here. But the reason I'm wanting to think it's using bootstrap is because of that right there, this kind of stuff, the columns. Or not, okay, there it is. There they are. Um, Let's see. I don't know, there's a way to really see what's what on here. So let's look for column S1. Fine. Column, that's not what I want to do. I'm trying to see where column S1 is used. Looks like it's not called. Okay, let's do column three. So they're using a class of column three. What's column three do? It's got a width of 25%. Or 25% is about the same. What was column three? Is the aside? It's the what? Okay. What? All that stuff. What, where, how? You can see whenever you make this bigger, the aside actually moves to the aside. And you can see how the size is of a change. So, right here, when the width is 768, minimum width, I'm assuming this is height and width. Or oh, this is probably width. Okay, this is probably width and this is height, just from looking at it. So let's say let's get it down to 600. Yeah. It's going to be between 600, at least 600, but less than 768. You can see how the content changes the place of it. So what the browser does, it takes into consideration the width of the screen that you're using or that the content that you're displaying, and then it makes adjustments to the individual columns for that. I'm not really seeing any differences here. 75, 83. Oh, okay. So it's got the cl different class names. I see it now. So if it's got a minimum width of 600 but less than 768, the class name is different. It's got that S. Um, so on the one that we was using, looking at right here, it's got a column three. So if it, the size of the screen is at least 768, which it is now because it's 922, then column three, if it, the width is going to be 25% for that aside area, is going to be 25% of the viewing. Um, and I'm assuming that is. But if it's if it's a 600 pixels, the width, but less than 768, then it would use the class of this right here. S12, which makes it a hundred percent. And that goes down there. So that's some concepts of responsive web design. Let's see.
Let's go next. Viewport, the viewport is a user's visible area of a web page. The viewport varies with the device and will be smaller on a mobile phone than on a computer screen. Before tablets and mobile phones, web pages were designed only for computer screens and it was common for web pages to have a static design and fixed size. But as we all know, there's multiple devices, everything from a computer, desktop, um, big, larger monitors um, to um, smaller, like I, um, I watch size things. So HTML5 introduced the method to let web designers take control over the viewport through the meta tag. So um, like again, whenever we do the emit of that exclamation, exclamation mark, let me open up a new page. That's a reminder file, new, and I'll save it. Um, practice.html. And what I'm talking about is whenever I do the shift and the exclamation mark, does the emit abbreviation, and I hit tab, and it comes up with this content right here. So a meta viewport element gives the browser instructions on how to control the page's dimension and scaling. Um, the width equals device width set part sets the page to the width of the font to follow the screen width of the device, which will vary dependent upon the device. Um, the initial scale 1.0 part sets the initial zoom level with when the page is first loaded on the browser. So here's an example of a web page without viewport meta tag and the same page with it. Users are, users are used to scroll websites vertically or on both desktop and mobile devices, but not horizontally. Um, and I agree with that. You know, scrolling horizontally can be kind of cumbersome. Um, there is not as something a second nature as scrolling hors um, vertically. So if the user is forced to scroll horizontally or zoom out to make the web page, to see the whole web page, a resource and poor user experience. Um, some additional rules to follow is do not use large fix with elements. Um, do not let the content rely on a particular viewport. And use CSS media queries to apply different styling for small and large screens. And for that was right here. These are the media queries, media, what do I call it again, media something, media queries, yeah. Okay. Um, let's see, go next. So we have grid views. Uh, many web pages are based on a grid view, which means that the page is divided into columns. And I think they use a default of 12 columns, most of them. Yeah. So a responsive grid often has 12 columns and has a total width of 100%, which will shrink and expand as you resize the browser window. So you can see, let's see. Okay, the width of the columns got smaller. Okay. So building a responsive grid view. So let's start with the responsive grid view. Um, first, ensure that all HTML elements have the box sizing properties set to border box. This makes sure that the padding and border are included in the total width and height of the elements. So we have um, this little is, is a wild card to um, for all, I believe. Yeah, all HTML elements. Yeah. Um, so let's go ahead and try it. So we got our viewport um, width equals uh, device width, and we initial scale 1.0. We got a wildcard here indicating for all HTML elements. 
and we got our header, we got our menu, got our classes of headers and menus, and main. And we have, um, let's see. Yeah. So we're going to use our class header, which looks like this. So the content for Chania, whatever that is, um, um, is going to be have a header or it's going to look, have this kind of characteristic. So you can look at Chania and it's got red border, it's got 15 print pixels padding. If you make some changes here, you can see that any changes that we apply here will um, result in the change of characteristics. So that would be whether it's the padding or the color. Problem with that. Okay. Go ahead and change that back to what it was. So the same concept with menu, um, any kind of changes we would make here would affect this portion right here. So we have a div class, main, so it talks about the city. This is the main portion of this page. Okay. What was the exercise we're supposed to be doing here? Oh, okay. So the example above is fine, which it was, okay, uh, with only two columns. However, we want to use a responsive grid review with 12 columns to have more control over the web page. So first we must calculate the percentage of one column, which is, you know, for this example, 100% divided by 12 equals 8.33. Then we make one class for each of the 12 columns and a number defining how many columns a section would span. So let's see, column one equals width of, looks like of that. Let's try. So we have, um, let's see what we got here. We got the border box, we got the header row, or the header styling. Let's see. So it looks like we're calling for all the classes that have a column that start with a column dash, which all of these do. So the div class of column three has a width of 25%. Which looks right. We have class of column nine as width of seventy five percent, which looks right. Okay, but let's change this to column six and what happens? Okay, so column six is 50%, right? So what happens is to column nine is set for 75% and you can't go any higher than 100%. So what happens is this goes on to the next, it kind of wraps, it kind of goes to the next. There's not enough room on this particular line, this particular area, so it goes down to where they can make room. But what if column nine, we change that to column one? Okay, so now it can, it starts right next to um, this one right here, but 
you know, all the content goes down like that. So that's not ideal either. Let's see. Okay. All these columns should be floating to the left and have a padding of 15 pixels. Okay. Um, let's go ahead and open that back up. Each row should be wrapped in a div. Let's do this on the second screen. Each row should be wrapped in a div. Right here, which it is. So we got div class row and div class row. And this is wrapped in a div, even though it's got a closing caret right there. There is no closing div until we get down to here. So all of these are considered to be using the class row. Um, so just to show that, well, what, you know, if we went ahead and close that div right there, hit run. Well, it looks like it won't do anything, but it's still considered within the div. It never really costs nothing to no problem. Okay. Let's go ahead and put that back there. But it's all considered within the div because that's the opening div and that's the closing div. Okay. So the columns inside of a row are floating to the left and they are therefore taken out of the flow of the page. Um, and other elements will be placed as if the columns do not exist. But to prevent this, we will add a style that clears the flow. So we have row, um, colon, colon, after. Add content, looks like it's empty, clear both, display table. So we also want to add some styles to make it look better. Let's see. So again, all of the HTML elements have a box border box size in this border box. Um, the, the row for after, let's see. Content is cleared out. Then we have the the styling. for the individual. So what would happen if we change that to right? Okay, you can see everything went to the right. Yeah. Let's see. So we have the class of the other thing with a class column. So what was that? This.
Okay, so the reason that this one went to the right instead of the reason this part went to the right instead of this one is because the browser read this one first. So what if we switch them around? Okay. So even though this is still floating to the right, this went back to the left hand side because now the order was changed. So let's hit if I can undo that in here. Yeah. And change this back to the left. Um, let's see. So media queries. A media query is a CSS technique introduced in CSS3. It uses the media rule to introduce a block of CSS properties if a condition is true. So, do I still have it open? Yeah, right here. Um, Fill this over. So in the browser window, 600 pixels or smaller, the background color will be light blue. So and that was our media role here, um, media only screen and max width of 600 pixels. Background colors light blue. And it's a response, but it not look good on small screen. Media queries can be helpful with that. We can add a breakpoint where the certain points of the design will behave differently. So when the screen the browser window gets smaller than 768 pixels, each column will have a width of 100%. Let's play with this one a little bit while we got this open. So we're going to copy this one. So at media only screen and max with 600 pixels. That's right. Okay. Body background color. Let's do that as. So if we got that right. So we're going to run it. So whenever it's a max width right now, it's 735. But let's get it down to 600. Okay. And you can see the background color changed based off the size, the width of it. Um. Okay. Shoot. Don't know what I did. Let's not do that. Oh. Um. So we can add a breakpoint when the screen browser window gets smaller than 768, each column should have a width of 100 percent. So let's try that here. Um, at media only screen and max with 768 pixels. It's a comment uh, for mobile phones. Class. So we're going to look for all classes that 
just have that start with the column dash with 100%. Okay. Did I do that right? Oh, max on someone's six, 769. It's a little off. Okay. So once we change that to something below 768, the width of the columns, anything that has a column. I should have changed to. So this changed to 100%. So another rule, let's see, there might be another rule. So because the browser reads it in order, let's comment that out. Or just cut it, because evidently I can't comment that in there. Okay, there we go. So a browser reads the rules from top to bottom. So I said one rule, and then there's another rule that overrode it. Overrode it, whatever. Um, so you can see how you can play with the sizing of it. And still, we still have that one that turned to badass. Did I get rid of it? No, there it is. For a max width of 600. So it still turns badass. It's kind of like a green color. And it's probably the only hex number I remember off the top of my head because it's funny. Um, okay, so that's a little bit about responsive web design. Um, you can do we're going there's images, the end videos, and frameworks. But we're not going to get into that right now. Um, actually, let's go ahead. So you can do, let's start with images. So we can, uh, with images, you can use the width property. So you have an image width is set to a percentage of the height, um, so the width is auto is 100% and the height is auto. So let's close out some of these other ones we got. So again, the default of a uh, width equals device width initial scale 1.0. We have an image, of, um, the width of the image is 100%, so it's full window, and the height is auto. So whatever it was by default, or it goes by default. Um, okay. So notice in the example above, the image can be scaled up to be larger than its original size. A better solution in many cases will be to use the max width property instead. So let's open that up again. Maybe, there we go. And I don't know if this will do it or not, but sometimes whenever you scale, zoom into an image, it gets kind of pixelated, so that might be a reason just to be wary if you're going to use that as the method for people to zoom in or to, for it to resize. So a better solution in many cases will be to use the max width property instead. So and the max width property is set to 100%, the image will scale down if it has to, but never scale up to be larger than its real original size, which is usually when things start getting pixelated. So let's try this one. So we have a max width of 100% and a height of auto. So what was the other one again? Max width was 100. 
Oh, max width. Okay, that was the difference. Max width um, is 100%. So it'll get smaller. If I could. Yeah, there we go. It'll get smaller, but it won't get any bigger. So using the max width property, okay, add an image, so try this one. So now we added an image to the responsive um, template that we were looking at earlier in the example. So we can see, I, thought that, I don't think they had max width. No, they don't, okay, gross. So the width, let's see. So what would happen if we change, this is the initial width that is going to appear. Um, maybe. Let's say we took some of this out because it's given us a classification. Let's go ahead and delete that. Now run it. There we go. So the image is resized based off what I had right here. And whenever we move this, um, move the size of the screen, it doesn't do anything. Um, but put back whatever I did. There we go. But we have a width of 100%, so it's going to fit to the width. And then it's going to, the height is going to scale automatically. But what if we had 50? Then it's going to be 50% of the width that's available. It's still going to scale but not to the extent you don't see the difference as well so okay um let's see background images background images can also respond to sizing and scaling so the background size property is set to contain and the background image will scale and try to fit the content area. However, the image will keep its aspect ratio over the image's height and width. So let's try this. So we have um, the viewport, we have our div. Okay, with the background image. So that was the image that they got. Uh, background, no repeat. Uh, background size is contain. And border is that red. We'll have to make that 200. Nothing really. Uh -huh. Okay. So there's a relationship with the height and the width on that. Um, The background size. What was the other one again? Contain. Uh, 
contain. Okay. So if the background size says 100, 100, then it's going to stretch out, which may or may not be the ideal. If the background property is set to cover, the background image will scale to cover the entire content. But the, the aspect ratio um, doesn't change, so the image may be clipped. So you don't see the entire image like we did before. So you want different images for different devices. A large way, um, a large image can be perfect on a big computer screen, but useless on a small device. So you can load a different image when you have to scale it. Um, to reduce the load or for any other reasons, you can use media queries to display different images on different devices. Okay, so whenever it's four width smaller than 400 pixels, right now it's 737, it changes. It's a good videos. So I believe the video concept is pretty similar. Um, we get the max width. Here, let's just start with the width. It's for the width of the um, the web page. You get the max width. So it sets a default size of the the frame and it'll get smaller, but won't get bigger. So let's say we set that to 800. So it'll get smaller, but will not get bigger. Okay, and here they added the video to the example. Frameworks. Um, I'm not going to mess with that. Okay, Bootstrap is what I mentioned earlier. Not a fan of it. Um, And then this is where we started. So what I want you guys to do, so let's go ahead and go back to VS Code and get rid of this. Okay, so you can see this is the reason, those are the reasons as to why this is different. Let me go ahead and close that out. So the links are going to external websites for the CSS and the fonts and um, the CDN right here. Looks like another font. So what I would like you guys to do is to make these, find a web template that you like and make it your own. So that would be, you know, obviously customizing the um, content. Um, so instead of for the title, instead of saying that W3 CSS template, it would say Tasha Panwell website, your name, obviously not mine. And this is preview tab, so you can't see what I just did at the title, but they're going to assume it's right. Um, so this is right here is where things can get kind of finicky in regards to templates because we have a lot of styling being done, but we don't necessarily see what it is and how to make those edits as needed. 
So let's start with the content that we can change as easily. So we got the home about photos contact. So home, let's leave home alone. Um, let's say, let's just make it a little bit different. Oh, home education um, experience and hobbies. I hit control to save it, and you should see that you should. It's not. Why is it not? Control save. Oh, I know why. Let's do control shift launch instead. There it is. So what you'll notice is, let's see. Where is it? So I'm not seeing anything indicating this is for the full screen, but I do see something on here says indicating for small screens. So you notice this content didn't change right here because I didn't change it down here um, for the smaller screens. So we have home, education, experience, hobbies. Home, education, experience, hobbies. And then I hit save and that should change. There we go. Um, so I'm gonna close that out and make this so I can see exactly what I'm doing. So there's a lot of styling that's in here. That's the good and the bad thing about templates. You know, you can take somebody else's styling, but then the bad thing is like then you're having to um, customize somebody else's styling if it doesn't meet what you're wanting it to do. So there, the, the way you can edit, you can edit it. It just can be kind of cumbersome. Let's see what's the best way to do this. So let's click on W3, let's click on this and it'll take us to that link. Maybe if I did it right. I don't think I did. Okay. I'm gonna go ahead and stop this video right here. And um, I'll pick up here in just a few. Okay, so whenever I click on that link, it takes me to the um, the CSS. So what you can do is copy all of that, Control A, Control C. What's that? Open up a new file, Control V, Control S, and we're going to name it. Um, um customized styles dot css so this is all the styling that's in the css that is affecting our um content and you'll see that they don't have the um spacing and that the the layout is it takes a while to read to get used to it um, but this is how the content is um, stylized so we're going to stop this right here and um, to be continued <laughs>